Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Crunch Seminar amidst uh, the summer vacation. So our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Catherine Clamroth. She would be talking to us about PINS training using bioobjective optimization, the trade-off between data loss and residual loss. A little bit about her. She leads the optimization group at the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science of the University of Wuppertal in Germany. Her team has a strong research focus on multi-objective optimization, spanning the bridge between discrete and discontinuous optimization applications. She received her PhD at the University of Braunschweig in 1994. In 2002, she attained the Habilitation at the University of Kaiserlautern. After six years at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, she moved to the University of Wuppertal in 2008. In 2019, Catherine received the Jörg Cantor Award of the International Society on Multiple Criteria Decision Making. So without any further ado, let's all welcome her for the presentation. You may want to uh, share your screen, Dr. Catherine. You are muted. Okay, so now I hope that you can all hear me and, and uh, see the slides. Okay, then first of all, I would like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present our work in this seminar. Um, I would like to give you a different perspective on training methods for neural networks or in machine learning in general, um, because as, as you introduced me already, my background is from optimization, mainly multi-objective optimization, and uh, only recently we joined efforts with Matthias Erhardt and Sarah Treibert, who are also here, um, who represent more the uh, physics and, and UDE part of this work, um, to develop a, a new perspective on training neural networks by really considering and analyzing the trade-off between the data loss and the residual loss. So this is joint work with uh, Fabian Heldmann, Sarah Treibert, and Matthias Erhardt. And I will later, if time allows, also talk a little bit about general challenges in neural network training, also in image classification. And then um, this is joint work with Marlena Reiners, Michael Stiegelmeier, and again, Fabian. Um, let me start with a quick overview of what I plan to tell you today. Um, I will use uh, as an example um, predictions, a PIN model to predict uh, COVID transmission rates. And uh, this is a problem that uh, I think Zara talked about some, some uh, time ago, also in this seminar, where we have two types of information, two pieces of information. We have data, and all I'm going to show you is about German data today. Um, it, it comes from the Robert Koch Institute who collects all the infection rates and, and uh, infected, vaccinated, and so on for Germany. And then at the same time, we have some, some physical knowledge about the dynamics of a pandemic. And to, uh, in, in this talk, we will use a compartment model that uh, will lead to a system of ordinary differential equations that model the dynamics of infections and uh, the situation. So our challenge is to make fast and reliable predictions of future transmission rates so that future political decisions uh, can be made on a, on a solid basis. And for this purpose, PINs are really a, a very good option because they uh, naturally compromise between data loss. We will use this notation MSEU in the following and residual loss that is physics in front loss that um, uses the dynamics uh, from the uh, compartment model to analyze the quality of a prediction. I will show you pictures during this talk that are slightly different from what you usually see probably. We will always have on one axis, the value of the residual loss. This is usually this axis here. And then on the other axis, the value of the data loss for a given neural network that was trained using whatever uh, stochastic gradient descent atom optimizer. 
So uh, most of the pictures or results are for a quite simple neural network, a feed-forward neural network with only six hidden layers and about 18,000 weights. These are our main training variables. So these are the, sorry, that was too fast, uh, the training variables of our um, neural network. And when we look at this point here, for example, with a little 0 0.5 up here, this would be the error values in both criteria for one specific uh, solution for one specific neural network that was trained. So a common approach is to use what we will call a weighted sum of our two training goals, the database loss, the data loss, and the residual loss. Now, when we look in this picture and use the equal weights, one half and one half, we could use one and one, it doesn't make really a difference, it's just a matter of scaling. Then in this figure, a level curve of this objective function, that is when we take this overall objective and set its value equal to some constant value, then in this image, this will be a linear function of these two values. So a level curve will always be a linear curve, Right, And because the scaling is slightly different on the axis, it's not really a diagonal curve in, in this case. And what we want to do is we want to minimize it. So we want to move this level curve as far down to the left as possible, um, and as long as we have feasible solutions. Right, So in this particular case, the optimal optimally trained network would be represented by, by this solution right here that has now this large sum. And we wouldn't see anything else from this figure, right? So if we just solve this problem, we don't see any other uh, possible training outcomes. Now the bi-objective perspectives considers both training goals independent of each other. They are individual objective functions that we both want to optimize. And then the same solution or outcome that we have here would be called Pareto optimal or non-dominated in the image space because we were not able to find another network that would map to an outcome vector down in this cone, in this uh, dominance cone that is below here. A network that would map, for example, here would be better with respect to both error functions, and it would always be preferred as long as no such network exists, no such solution exists, we call a solution here Pareto optimal or non-dominated. So the same solution is Pareto optimal that we found before with the weighted sum approach, but there are other solutions. And I want to just give you some examples. For example, this solution is Pareto optimal. It is not dominated. This one down here, actually all the crosses and the criterion is always that when we attach a dominance cone, like searching for solutions that improve with respect to both criteria, we cannot find anything. Now, if we are able to generate an approximation like in this image of what we call the set of interesting or non-dominant alternatives, then we can perform a trade-off analysis and see what is the trade-off? How much can I gain? If I want to gain something in the data loss, how much do I have to give up in the residual loss? So how bad does the uh, representation um, with respect to the physical model get? And um, this information helps us to adapt training goals to find actually reasonable values of weights that adapt to a specific problem. And it also gives us some information on the quality of the physical model that we have here. So I should emphasize that what we do here is we consider mainly problems where we have data that come, comes from a real application, from a real world application. Um, there are also, there's a lot of work on, on training pin, pins, physical, physics informed neural networks, just based on a, a physical model and then data is generated um, um, artificially. So artificial data is generated. Then usually the data is well aligned to the model. But in our case here, when we want to predict uh, COVID transmission rates, we are really not so sure whether the model that we came up with is, is very precise. And actually, it will turn out later on that the data error, as you can probably see here already, is really large if we have a, a high weight on the residual loss and that what we are really interested in is solutions with a smaller data error um, that use only uh, little information from the model. 
So this is the, the outline of what I want to, to do. And I told you more or less the whole story, but we will have to jump into some details. So let's start from the physical model. Um, based on the work of Zara and Matthias from uh, 2022, um, we use the compartment model with five compartments. And this graph illustrates the dynamics between the different uh, compartments. So we uh, consider a compartment of susceptible individuals that may get COVID, um, then uh, a, a compartment of vaccinated individuals that have been vaccinated and are just at least partially protected. We have a set of infected individuals, hospitalized individuals, and recovered individuals. And then maybe I show you at least the majority of parameters right away. Then we can uh, formulate a system of ordinary differential equations that describes the dynamics of each of these compartments. So let's look, for example, at the compartment of susceptible individuals, those people that potentially get infected rather soon. And um, I want to kind of, there are two parameters here that I didn't even list. Um, lambda here is uh, what we call recruitment rate or birth rate, the number of people that come additionally from the outside to the current population. And mu over here is the mortality rate. And in Germany, this more or less equals out. It really doesn't make a large difference. So we set these two parameters to zero to simplify them all. I won't talk much about that. Um, then this term here, it, it occurs in, in, in uh, uh, most of the, uh, the equations. That's the standard incidence rate that we get from uh, basically from the data. Okay. Then when we now look at this first uh, equation here, then the dynamics in the set of susceptible individuals uh, can be understood by, well, it's, it, it, the, the set will always be reduced based on the incidence rate because people that are infected or that get infected, they will leave this uh, set of susceptible individuals. And then um, we uh, later in, in um, after some months when some people were vaccinated, we also reduce the, the number of susceptible individuals by those that get vaccinated, right? So Ka we have- Sorry, three. Catherine, yes. the, is there like a type of the, the transmission rate, uh, rate is theta or beta? Um, the transmission risk is beta. So- and Where's beta in the, where's beta in the equations? Sorry? Ah, it's hidden in the in, in this, so it's hidden in the theta, which uh, I try to explain. So it's hidden in the theta, and this product it uses the transmission risk in order to compute uh, overall. You get the incidence rate. Okay, okay, okay. So theta, theta, it, the transmission rate is a function of time, right? That's yes. what you have. It's a function okay. of time. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah um, and. Uh, maybe I can go a little further. So uh, this is this is what I wanted to emphasize. Also, um, actually, the transmission risk is something that we don't naturally know from the data. We cannot extract it right away, as we cannot extract uh, the residual infection probability after being vaccinated. So these two parameters, uh, we we don't have data for that, and they will be trained by the pin simultaneously to the predictions. Okay, and then we have for the other compartments, we have similar dynamics that describe, similar equations that describe the dynamics. Um, and we have lots of data. So uh, as, as everybody has by now. So this is weekly data and I, it's, it's more than, than fits on the slide and the details are maybe not so, so relevant. And you can see that this enters our training process. So we have data from Germany uh, for uh, actually six compartments, susceptible, vaccinated, infected, um, hospitalized, disease, uh, dead, <laughs> and recovered individuals. And uh, so each, of these vectors has, has all these values. Um, 83 million is approximately the population of Germany. Then in the beginning, nobody was vaccinated. 
in the early weeks, only very few were infected and hospitalized, very few had died, and the number of recovered was small. And you can, you can see that, for example, the number of recovered is, is strictly increasing here, um, the, similar to the number of, of dead people who have died from COVID. Um, the number of vaccinated starts picking up somewhere here. So it's zero for quite some time until the vaccines got, uh, became available, and then it picks up. Um, we use data from uh, some time in March 2020. Um, then having the physical model, a first approach would be to predict uh, the transmission rates using solutions of this, of this system of ODEs. And in the work of, of Treibert and Ehrhard Sarah and, and Matthias used a non-standard finite difference method to make such predictions. And what you can see here from starting from week 33 um, in 21, um, the black curve is what the real data was. And you can see that at some point the Omicron wave uh, started. Uh, while the predictions just based on the um, ODE system are rather smooth curves that predict basically one, one next, one coming wave, depending on the parameters chosen for the beta here. So this is not really satisfactory. And of course, one could go ahead and uh, extend the model, for example, by making these infection rates time dependent. Um, another approach that we followed here is to use PIN that takes data into account as well. And um, what we can get then, this is, this is basically not the best results that we have. I will show you nice, nicer results later, but that allows us now in, in the red curve here, to make predictions even for several waves uh, of the pandemic. Okay, so a little bit about pins, even though I think I don't have to explain much in, in this group. Um, what we want to do is we want to combine measured data with physical knowledge. The dynamics are given by differential equations. Our COVID uh, predictions are just one example. Often pins are used as surrogate models to solve uh, differential equations, ordinary uh, partial um, differential equations. Um, and then the data is, is as I said, uh, artificially generated very often. In our case, we have this real data and we have a real trade-off. So here, um, our system of ODEs only approximates the dynamic and the data. And there's a true trade-off between data loss and residual loss. So that, that makes actually pin training particularly challenging. Um, we use a network with six layers, so I skipped the layers in between, and we trained it to predict the compartment sizes and our two parameters that we cannot directly extract from the data. And as our training goes, we use the data loss, so that always compares the um, compartment sizes with the training data. And uh, the residual loss is computed based on the ODE system. It uh, uses automatic differentiation to um, extract the dynamics from the pin, from the neural network. And it also uses the predictions for our two parameters. So these are our two objective functions. This is just a schematic view of what we are doing. So in order to define our objective functions, the training goals, we need a little bit of, of notation. Um, this first vector PF is the vector of all fixed parameters that we get from the data. Then we have these two parameters that we want to train, beta and kappa. Kappa was uh, related to this vaccination, kind of people that may still get infected after being vaccinated. Then um, the vectors that we really need to evaluate our objective functions are the compartment sizes at different times t and a discretization of the ODE system for the same, same time steps. So F here uh, represents for a given uh, compartments, it uh, represents the right-hand side of the ODE system. And then we want that this difference equals zero, that is the ODE is satisfied. Um, our goal is to approximate the measured and future compartment sizes um, that map from time to five compartments by the pin output. And the pin depends on our two parameters, P and beta and kappa, right, uh, uh, in P. 
and on the weights of the neural network. And then for a choice for a given solution, P and W, um, we get an output for the five compartments. So the data loss uh, is, is in our case computed as the mean squared error. So we have data at discrete times, T1 to Tm, and then we compute the mean squared error between the prediction from the pin and the true data. We could, as you just mentioned in the beginning, use other norms here. We could use an L infinity norm. It wouldn't change the general method, or method that we apply. And this is maybe something that we should try out. Then for the residual loss, um, we have to evaluate how much or by how much our prediction deviates from the dynamics of uh, the ODE system. So we, we evaluate the difference between the dynamics from the pin using automatic differentiation and the right-hand side of the ODE system evaluated for the predicted compartment sizes. So if the pin exactly represents the ODE system, and we managed to do a very good job, then we would assume that at least approximately um, this value here would be zero for all times in which we compare, right? Because then the ODE system would be satisfied. So it's quite natural to define the residual loss also as a mean squared error now with respect to the deviation from satisfying the ODE system. So our two objective functions are have a similar type and therefore also from a mathematical or optimization point of view, they have similar slopes and curvature, which, may, which is actually a nice property. So both are mean squared errors. Um, and maybe now this, this picture is easier to understand for the data loss, we just need K and the training data. For the residual loss, we need P. This was the right-hand side of our ODE system. We need the dynamics in, in K uh, from, from the pin prediction to evaluate the residuals. Then a standard training objective for pin training would be to put these two training goals into one weighted sum, very often with a weight one half. So if we use the weight one half, again, I'm illustrating this in this bi-dimensional picture, residual loss, oops, no, residual loss versus data loss, we get exactly one solution, right? This point 0 0.5. We could have used a larger weight for the data, right? So the first term here is the data loss. If we increase alpha to close something close to one, then we automatically at the same time reduce the weight of the second uh, training goal of the residual loss. Then we have a a higher emphasis on the data and we would get a point down here, right? Much smaller data loss, uh, but uh, we pay with a larger residual loss. Our, the multi-objective perspective now considers those criteria independently. And as I said already on the very first slide, then basically the weighted sum with weights one half and one half would generate one output right? Um, we have linear level curves that we want to move down. And by varying this level curve, we can generate different, different um, efficient solutions, up, outcome vectors. So like these three, for example, that I showed already in the beginning. Now this uh, helps us to analyze and understand the training goals better and their role for the given problem and trade-offs. And um, as I said, it, it will give us some, some means to assess the model quality and explain what we are doing. So just a, a short introduction into multi-objective optimization. Um, here's our problem again. We have these two training goals or objective functions. Then we are interested in solutions and trained networks, the weights and the two parameter values. And we call such, such a solution, W star P star Pareto optimal. If there is no other solution, WP, such that the data error is at least as good or smaller, and the residual error is at least as good or smaller, 
And at least one of these inequalities should be strict. So a solution W star P stars Pareto optimal, if it cannot be improved in both criteria simultaneously without deterioration in at least one of the criteria. And this is just an illustration here, not coming from real data. We have our two objective functions and say we have a couple of possible outcome vectors of possible solutions. Then the orange ones would be the Pareto optimal while the black ones are dominated. And we can always see that by attaching an ordering cone, a dominance cone. So if we consider, for example, this solution here, then all solutions that are below here in this area, in this cone, would dominate it, right? So for example, this one, this black one, or this orange one and this orange one, they are all better with respect to both criteria. So we would always prefer one of these solutions over that one no matter what our particular preferences are. Also those that are here kind of on the boundary of this cone would be preferred because well, in one objective they are as good, but in the other they are better. And still we would always decide for a solution that improves all our criteria or stays at least as good. So this black one is dominated. We don't want to worry about it. We throw it away. We would like to keep the orange ones because there this ordering cone, this dominance cone is empty. Yes, we didn't find a solution that is better in both criteria, and this is what we would like to keep. Now, when we uh, form weighted sum scatterizations, this is how we call that in, in, in multi-objective optimization, that is when we combine both criteria into one objective function, single objective, with a, well, one weight for the first and then one minus the weight for the second that allows us all possible weighted sums actually. So we vary this weight between zero and one, and we can put more emphasis on the first or on the second objective, just as we wish. Um, so for example, we could put all the focus on, uh, on the second objective function, right, on MSEF. Minimize it all the way, and we would find this solution. In this case, the level curve would be a, a vertical line. We could put, we could use more or less equal weights or just change the emphasis, then we will, for example, be able to recover this solution as an optimal solution. We can put all the emphasis on um, the, the second objective and we would find this solution here. However, no matter how we vary the weights, we will always only find solutions that are on the convex hull of the outcome set. Because if we try to recover this orange point here, that is also a Pareto optimal or non-dominated, then it's not possible to find a weighting vector, a linear level curve that cannot be moved further so that this point would be optimal. We will always find solutions on the convex hull that are better, no matter how we change the weights. This is a clear disadvantage of using weighted sums and the motivation for also using other means of combining our optimization goals into what we call scalarizations to, to derive single objective problems um, that allow to recover uh, Pareto optimal solutions. But in, in uh, the applications that we consider here so far, using weighted sums was good enough. We didn't observe non-convexities in the problems, at least not until now, but this is something we always have to keep in mind when combining different optimization or training goals into one weighted sum objective. So how do we solve these problems now? Um, I want to show you two multi-objective training approaches that are both using just first order information. So just gradient information. Um, and the first that I would like to talk about is a generalization of stochastic gradient descent to a multi-objective version. And uh, um, this is based on work of you and Vicente from 2019, stochastic multi-gradient descent. Advantage is that it requ requires only one training run and it's thus relatively cheap, not more expensive than uh, um, just using equal weights to begin with, but it generates only one Pareto solution. We don't get the whole Pareto front and no, appro uh, no approximation. And moreover, it's hard to incorporate preferences in the optimization process. The outcome, the solution found, depends on the starting solution, on the initialization of the weights, actually. And this is something that is hard to play with, really. 
Um, and we observed in, in image classification problems that it tends to prioritize objective functions that have larger slopes and larger curvature. Now, the alternative is to use scalarization based methods that is repeated solutions of, for example, weighted sums problems by varying the weights. Now, this clearly requires several training runs and is just much more expensive, but we get more information. We can potentially approximate the Pareto front. And our challenge is to identify relevant rates while keeping the computational costs at least reasonable. So let's first talk, uh, I would like to give you at least some insight into the SMGD algorithm. Um, so suppose that we have a general multi-objective problem with a, a general number of just two, but Q objective functions. Then in iteration K, we determine a descent direction that is as steep as possible for all objective functions. So we try to find a compromise between the individual descents, between the individual negative gradient directions. And we find such a steepest common descent direction by solving an auxiliary problem that determines actually weighting coefficients that weight the individual gradients. So GJK is an individual gradient of um, in iteration K of objective function J and the lambda J form a weighted sum. And then of course, this gradient would also be a gradient of one particular weighted sum of the original objective functions with these weights. However, these weights may change from one iteration to the other. So it's not equivalent to solving one weighted sum problem to begin with. So we try to find this best possible common descent direction that lies in the convex hull of all the individual gradients, basically by projecting um, onto this convex hull. These lambdas, again, are normalized. They have to sum up to one. So we consider only convex combinations. All lambda j have to be greater or equal than zero. Um, so as I said, lambda now is a weighting vector, but it's iteration dependent. It depends on the iteration k. Then it's just uh, so the, it's, it, it reads very similar to the stochastic gradient descent algorithm and just a very quick uh, outline. So uh, in one iteration, we uh, use a batch uh, approach. So we choose a subset of all the data. We may have huge sets of training data with a given cardinality, compute approximated uh, gradients for this iteration by just considering the mean squared error over this subset, um, compute all these uh, individual approximated gradients, then solve our auxiliary problem, uh, compute the common descent direction, the direction of steepest common descent, and update. Right? So this is one iteration. And we did some tests in image classification on MNIST and C410 data. If time allows, I will tell you a little bit more about that later. And what I want to show you is that what we observed is the weights were in these applications very, very small. So close to having numerical difficulties, very, very small. And over the epochs, they changed. So first they decreased even more and then later on they were increasing, but kind of staying very small all the time. And the final outcomes were not what we would have chosen if we had the whole Pareto form. I hope to show you some images later on. But um, in the PIM training, we um, were really interested in finding an approximation of the trade-offs. So we applied scalarization-based methods. So the challenge, just to remind you, is to identify relevant weights. So here's our picture again. What we would love to have is an approximation of the whole Pareto front. Um, and the first approach would be to simply scan. And this is what we did in this figure here. You can see all these little numbers here. These are the different weights we evaluated. So we scanned the weight space. We just started with 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, up to 0 0.95. So the weight is always the weight for the data loss and the weight for the residual loss is one minus this number, right? So for 0 0.95, you see that the data loss is more important. We have a solution that has a very small data loss, but a pretty large residual loss. So this is one approach. It generates nice approximations of the Pareto front. 
but it's very expensive because we have to run so many trainings, individual trainings. So each of these points needs an individual training. An alternative that we implemented here and that performs much better in practice is called dichotomic search. Um, it adaptively solves weighted sums categorizations based on the solutions that we had that we have obtained before. So suppose that we start with a kind of the solution up here, weight close to zero, and another solution weight close to one. We call those the extremal solutions. Right? So we have two out oops, two outcome vectors here. Then we can compute the convex hull, in this case, just the line segment connecting these two and use the normal vector of this convex hull as the next to define the next weight, because we try, we want to interpret this, this line passing through these two points as the level curve of the next weighted sum scalarization we want to solve. So we want to move this line as far as possible down to the left lower corner here. So we would, for example, find this point, we update the convex hull, get to new line segments, interpret them again as level curves of our next scalarization and compute the corresponding weights by, it's a geometric calculation to get the normal vector, right? And then what we can do is we can do that iteratively and adaptively while using fast trainings in the beginning where we want to explore the, the Pareto front. And with fast training, I mean, that we don't wait until the pin has fully converged, but we stop after fewer plus, just to obtain a rough approximation. And we can also, by stopping at some point, so in the first iteration, we get these three, and then we keep these three and continue, we, we find these two in addition, and then we refine until at some point we say, okay, now our time limit is reached, or our approximation is fine enough, and we can stop always with a reasonable approximation. And then another advantage is that once we say, once, once we observe that, okay, the data error is too large over here, we are interested in solutions with a smaller data error, we can refine the search in, in regions down here and restart the process with some solutions that we have and just refine. So challenges, are actually not so much in pin training, but in image classification problems, um, if the two training criteria are structurally different, then we have all kinds of problems with uh, premature termination, unreliable convergence, and so on. In the pin training case, where both objectives are mean squared errors, it works pretty well. However, we can overcome these difficulties by enhancing the adaptive weight computation by what we call by section search. And that leads to or led to the development of an algorithm that we call BATS, uh, by section enhanced dichotomic search. And let me again just highlight what is different from um, applying a pure stochastic gradient descent. Um, maybe I start here. So let's, let's look down here. So we, we go in iterations and we, we solve or we, we train with one solution, one selection of weighting vectors, lambda, we call them lambda, or alpha, it doesn't matter. Um, we train every time for one choice of lambda. So uh, the, the challenge is really to update these weights. And what we have down here is this adaptive scheme we have two adjacent to neighboring points that we computed before, can i and can i minus one from two previous iterations, compute that difference. And based on the difference, um, we can compute this normal vector and the corresponding weight. It looks more complicated than it is. If uh, some kind of stopping or quality criterion by the last training is not satisfied, then we simply compute the next weight by bisecting the parent weight interval. And then we uh, continue with the training. So um, in our case here, uh, now in a uh, little bit larger uh, visualization, we started with 0 0.1 and 0 0.99. And then the first uh, new weighting vector that was computed here was 0 0.52. And we found this next point. And then in the next level of the search hierarchy, we computed these two solutions and you can see that after already three levels, we have actually already at level two, we have a reasonable approximation of a Pareto form. 
you can stop here. And it's not overly expensive because it requires like five individual trainings. Um, and if, if, if you use fewer reports, it's really not so expensive. Now we wanted to refine down here in this region, and this is what I show you on the next uh, slide. So we restart, re-initialize the search in the interval from 0 0.8 to 0 0.99. And then we can observe that the data error can be still quite uh, significantly reduced um, until um, we find a solution down here. I'm sorry about that. I cannot answer the phone. So we will have to have it ringing for a while and I cannot stop it, unfortunately. But um, I uh, want to show you what, so these, all these pictures just so, show you images in the objective space. We just, we don't see the real solutions. We just see the uh, values of the uh, data loss and of the residual loss. Um, the actual solutions all look like this. So now we are back to the predictions for COVID infection numbers. And I'm showing you some examples for training data starting from week 40 and 21 until week two and 22, that is sometime in January. And we see the black is again, the real data, the true data, right? So um, we see that we had two waves in this time frame, and the red are the predictions for different values of alpha. We have 0 0.85 here, 0 0.9, and 0 0.95. And we can see that we get really good predictions, actually, um, particularly for 0 0.95. And I should have included uh, 0 0.98 also, because then you see that predictions get a little bit worse again. Um, so it is true that in this situation, the data has a very large impact on the quality of the predictions. However, completely ignoring the dynamics uh, predicted from the physical model leads to worse results, to not so good results. Um, so this is a point where I could stop with the conclusion, or I show you if, if uh, I have maybe five more minutes, a little bit about image classification. We can go ahead with the image classification. OK, cool. So I'll try to be quick. Um, so just a little outlook, multi-objective training techniques in other machine learning applications. and. Um, I will particularly focus on image classification. And then the challenge is that neural network training is often really very costly and unreliable. We have many local minima. Uh, what I talked about up to now and in the following is always first order methods and stochastic gradient descent applications. So the first challenge is to find a proper training goals in image classification particularly to avoid overfitting and overparameterization. This is not such a big problem in, in pin training as, as I understand so far, but in image classification, it's a huge problem. And we would like to keep the network small by getting rid of unnecessary weights, parameters. So we used MNIST data. I'm, I'm sure you know this. We have all these handwritten digits um, and a classical uh, uh, convolutional neural network architecture, LeNet network, um, where we uh, particularly focused with the pruning on one of the dense layers. And we use C410 data. These are these kind of um, bird, dog, cat, car, airplane images that I find even with my eyes sometimes hard to classify. Um, and they also come in 10 classes and we use a classical network architecture, again, not our own architecture, but a, a given architecture, but adopted the train. Um, as error functions, uh, we considered, or, or possibilities are the cross entropy. It's, it's very commonly used in image classification. We used before in the pin training, the mean squared error, it's also here. One could also use some much likelihood uh, error function. So in the image classification, we used the cross entropy and a regularization term that avoids, or that's supposed to avoid, avoid overfitting by reducing the number of parameters that are really used in the network. 
And uh, in this case, we use the sum of absolute values of weights while actually aiming on reducing the number of non-zero weights in the neural network. So again, we have two training goals that we considered in this multi-objective framework. The classical regularization combines them in a weighted sum. Now, I can use this terminology because um, you know it by now. So um, this is immediately aiming at reducing overfitting, overparameterization. This, this is a figure taken from Wikipedia where you can see what I mean. If you have so many parameters, like try to approximate these black data points by a high dimensional polynomial, um, you get an approximation that is not really reasonable. You could do with much fewer parameters, you could get a nice linear approximation. So what helps? Use more data across validation, many different schemes or regularization. This is what we did. Uh, we used the sum of absolute values of weights uh, and the number of weights contained in the neural networks and reinforced um, the, the training, the regularization by pruning weights that fell below a given threshold. So the idea is to complement the descent steps in the stochastic gradient descent by pruning weights that fall below a threshold. We tried batchwise and epochwise pruning. Um, and because the, the, so the weights are set to zero if they are pruned, but they may recover in later iterations. Uh, they still contribute to the gradient uh, computation. And what we observed is that a large number of weights, depending on, again on the choice of the weighting parameter here, a, a large number of weights dropped to zero very quickly. So they were actually not needed. So, um, um, again, we use this inter so I want to motivate that we use this interpretation as a biobjective problem because we are basically aiming at an uh, auto ML technique that reduces the size of the network while keeping the quality high. So uh, side effects are reduced network complexity and better explainability. So here's our biobjective problem now. Um, with a, again, with a data loss function and a regularization term. And our training variables are the weights of the neural network. And I'm showing you experiments on the MNIST data on these digits uh, on the LINET5 architecture. So we, uh, the weighted sum scalarization is very simple. Basically, you fix the weight of the data loss to one and um, vary the weight of uh, the regularization. And what we observe here is quite different from what we observed in pin training. Actually, there seems to be uh, a pretty sharp, what we would call a knee solution somewhere down here. That is, we can, um, we can improve the uh, L1 or we can reduce the network complexity quite a lot without losing much with respect to the data element. There's really a very sharp trade-off and solutions that we are, would be really interested in are somewhere here. We call those knee solutions because the Pareto front forms a sharp knee. So the BADS algorithm in this case, it really had problems with the very different characteristics of the training goals. And you can see now sometimes in red that we had to use bisection to overcome local minima from the training. So when you see a point here, this is a solution or represents a solution obtained after applying the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, but it's not a, we, we can never be sure that this generates a global optimum, right? So there may be other training runs with different initialization within different whatever random choices that produce dominating outcomes, even though theoretically this should not be possible. So that's why we use um, the uh, bisection. And you can see that after very or rather few training runs, we are identify more or less automatically the knee solutions down here. They are basically here. So now we refine, but actually at this point uh, already here, I think we have enough information. The point is that we can really reduce the complexity of, an, of the network significantly without giving up much with respect to the accuracy. So let me summarize. What have we achieved? The 
multi-objective perspective provides or supports a better understanding of trade-offs between our different goals when training neural networks. Let it be networks for image classification or other applications, or let it be physics-informed neural networks. We have implemented a, a multi-SGD algorithm and a, a BAS algorithm, tested and compared them. And we have combined that with intertraining pruning to reinforce regularization if it's present. What do we plan to do next? We want to include further training goals. So in the pin training, there could be other physical properties that can be included. Um, we could include regularization terms if necessary as further objective functions and consider the problems even in higher dimensions, that is not only with two training goals, but with three or four training goals. Simultaneously or in parallel, we will try to improve the stochastic multi-gradient descent by um, incorporating some preference information to control the targeting towards compromised solutions. We would like to improve the knee identification so that it can be done more automatically. An important uh, task is to derive from this analysis uh, quality indicators that for pin training can tell us something about the quality or the alignment of the data with the physical model that we use and maybe give even some hints on how to change or modify the model to better represent the data. Then a, a big problem often are outliers in the data. So we will try to understand whether it's possible to automatically identify outliers. And in the neural network training, we would like to, of course, consider all the parameters W and some maybe some physical parameters, but also the general network structure. That is something that we haven't done so far, but should we use six uh, hidden layers or seven or even more or some other structures? This is something we want to investigate. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And um, this picture that you see here was generated by Matthias Ottmann, a colleague from uh, computer science department in, in Wuppertal. And it actually shows you some, some um, artificial artwork based on an image of the University of Wuppertal that is nicely located on a hill in uh, uh, Western Germany. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gatry. Do we have questions? You will have to talk because I won't see it. Yeah. Or I should maybe st stop sharing the screen. I can go back and I can see. It. <laughs> I I just have one one I, I want to say it's a really excellent talk. Um, Thank I have you. one suggestion that I wanted to make, and this is more just like a pins trick. But we had a very at the beginning of COVID, we did work for the um, New Mexico Department of Health fitting these same kind of compartment models. Um, and I think on slide nine, you wrote out the residual that you were working with. Um, it made an incredible difference if instead of doing like a point collocation residual in time, you do like the integral form of that. Um, so you would do like um, U at M plus one minus U N is equal to the integral of f of u um, across that time step and then do Gauss quadrature. It, it was something like two or three orders of magnitude and then we could actually give them, we can make it work for them <laughs> and, and they use it for this I kind of production. Thing, so. We will have to go through all of them. Um, yeah. You meet on which slide? Um, I believe it was slide nine. Yes, right here. Yeah. So instead of doing this, right, the point evaluation of the time derivative and the point yeah. evaluation of f of p, you can do that over a time interval. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That makes sense. You know, in the yeah. integral form of that, um, which is weaker and you get more regularity out of it. So it, it's just a little trick, but it was like such a game changer for us. I'd, I'd hate. It's so easy to do in the code. You know? Okay. So okay. Thank you. We will certainly try that. Yep. Yep. Katrina, I, I could see the reviewers asking about comparisons with the dynamic weights, the self-adaptive weights, and so on. And 
are you doing better in terms of accuracy, but then do you pay more or the self-adapted? For example, we some data, Kamal, all this people like Kamal, for example, has this, this project with the um, transient dynamics of a diesel engine, which for some reason is not very far from the COVID <laughs> models. <laughs> it's compartmental models, <laughs> uh, all these. But anyway, we use this uh, self-adaptive weights, uh, which are very, very uh, effective. So the, I mean, how would you compare? You, you, you're not comparing with, with the rest of the world, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, not in this talk. Of course, we, we do that in, in the paper a little bit at least. Um, so the difference is that we do not aim at kind of in one shot trying to find optimal weights. So I, I try to be very careful in saying optimal weights because I, I find it very hard to say beforehand, before analyzing a problem and before seeing different alternatives to say what would be optimal. So most of these methods would kind of have an adaptive way of moving somewhere to the Pareto front. And it's true that there are some, some papers that also uh, acknowledge that there is a Pareto front, but I haven't seen many people that try to approximate the trade-offs and really approximate alternative networks. Um, and um, so what, what we claim is that only after doing this analysis do we get the information that the first trainings that we got had a pretty large data loss, maybe because we should have weighted the model less, we should have given the model less importance because the, the, the span here between the extremal solutions is really large. And um, the, there is some, some indication that the model does not fully represent the data. So this information is much easier obtained after getting an approximation. So the main, main difference is we approximate the Pareto front and do not try to just in one shot find one solution. Did that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Uh, uh, but by the way, the, the, why the uh, numbers are side? You didn't normalize? Do you normalize the outputs? You have like the residual is like 10, 10 to the 11 and 10 to the... Uh, yes, why? But um, actually, we, we tried also with normalization. It um, didn't change much. They are in very similar orders of magnitude. And this is, this is really specific to this particular application because it's both mean squared errors. They are very similar. So normalization, of course, in image classification, we use normalization to get a better understanding of the weights, yes. but um, here it didn't change much. Okay. I have a short question. Sorry. I'm at home from Brown. Uh, for multi-objective uh, optimization, we usually have uh, conflicting objectives. For the first part of uh, your presentation, we have two kinds of error, MSC error. I didn't get the conflicting part of these uh, uh, objectives. Um, the, the conflict is sort of the, the well, wait, I should, it will be easier to see it here. Um, the two objective functions are, so the first objective function is the data error that basically measures how well aligned our predictions are with the measured data. And the second objective function, so this is just database and the data is measured. It's not coming from an ODE system, it's just measured. Um, the residual loss um, measures how kind of the deviation from the ODE predictions or from the dynamics. So how the dynamics of our pin output deviate from the dynamics of the ODE that we used as a model for the prediction, but it's not precise. So if the model was precise, the conflict would, should be much smaller. But since the model is not precise, there's a pretty large conflict here. And this is what I, what I mean when I say that, so depending on how, how much conflict we observe, um, that is um, how close these solutions or these outcomes get to something like an ideal solution, if there's no conflict, we will be able to find a, a, a network that maps to what we call the ideal point, somewhere close to zero, zero, would be perfect for both criteria. So the, the 
smaller the span or the variety of the solutions is, the smaller the conflict is and the better the model represents the given problem. But in our case, we have conflict because the model, well, it represents the dynamics, but not very precisely. Right. And uh, also for the multi-objective optimization and using the scalarization method, as I know, the challenging part is uh, selecting weights for scalarization um, problems. Uh, is there any way to uh, use a special or find a special kinds of uh, weights for this problem or just selecting, I don't know, randomly? I mean, how to select these uh, weights? No, randomly, I, I wouldn't say, randomly, I think it's not, it's not a good idea. So yes. <laughs> what we did, <laughs> we, we did it adaptively. So uh, it's quite natural to start with something close to the boundaries to see the span of the alternatives. So we would start with the 0.05 to find a point here and 0.95 to find another point here. And that gives us already some information, right? So we can compute um, a line passing through these two points. It's a geometrical uh, problem, right? It's, so it's, it's not so much fun to do that, but it's not hard either. Um, yeah. And then this is interpreted as a level curve of the next weighted sum problem that we solve. Um, so we try to move this down and we compute the weights that do exactly that. And then that means that based on where we were, we find a solution that is basically worst approximated by the current representation that we have. So the next representation would consist of three points here. And we have added that point that was furthest away in a certain measure. So I omitted all these mathematical or technical details that is in a certain sense furthest away from the current kind of linear approximation. And we obtain a new approximation, piecewise linear of the whole Pareto front. So this new approximation, this line segment and this line segment give rise for new weights. So we would move this out, this out and generate two more points. So you can, you can see that here, right? So we start, we, we first compute with 0 0.1 and 0 0.99. The line here gives rise to the weight 0 0.52. The normal vector is exactly that, right? So we find this point. Then we update the piecewise linear approximation and adaptively kind of where we had the worst approximation, we find adaptively new points here and here. So these are not just somehow randomly selected weights, but they are based on the, the computations from the previous steps. And we can stop at any time. Did that explain yeah. your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thanks. Do we have more questions? So uh, thank you, Dr. Catherine, for uh, tuning in today and giving us this wonderful talk. Well, thank you very much again for, for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I hope to, well, I always try to promote multi-objective optimization as a wonderful way to understand problems from a different perspective. So thank you. Yeah. We'll move on to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. Enrico. Uh, you may want to share your screen, Dr. So he would be talking to us about data-driven discovery of focal Planck equations for the Earth's radiation belt electrons using pins. A little bit of introduction. He is the research associate at the University of Colorado and is affiliated with the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Science and the NOAA Space Research Center in, Boulder, in Colorado. He has a PhD in space plasma physics from Queen Maryland University at London and is the postdoctoral experience from Los Alamos National Laboratory. His research covers computational plasma physics, space physics, and space weather. Recently, his efforts have been focused on using scientific machine learning for advancing the field of space weather prediction, with a particular focus on bridging physics-based and data-driven approaches. He is the editor of the book, Machine Learning Techniques for Space Weather, and is an associate ed editor of the Space Weather and Space Climate International Journal. With that, you may want to take away. 
All right. Can you see my screen well and hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm actually uh, currently I'm in a hotel room attending a workshop, so I switched off my video because it seemed to have a pretty low bandwidth. But hopefully the Wi-Fi will will work. Uh, so, well, first of all, thanks a lot for the kind invitation. Uh, so I'm going to present a work which has recently been published uh, on uh, the Journal of Geophysical Research, which I believe uh, is the, the very first application of PINs uh, in the using real satellite uh, space physics uh, data. So hopefully that will be of interest to you. However, I realize this is uh, not my uh, sort of typical audience. So I will spend the first few slides just sort of introducing space weather, uh, assuming that uh, uh, Assuming that um, uh, not many of you might be familiar with that. Um, so uh, as usual, or as it's sometimes the case, the, the best definition actually comes uh, from Wikipedia. So space weather is a branch of space physics and aeronomy, which are collectively called heliophysics, concerned with the time varying condition within the solar systems that includes the solar wind. Uh, and it focuses on the space surrounding the earth uh, which include conditions in the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere, and, and exosphere. Uh, now, why uh, are we interested in, in space weather? Is because the sun is a very uh, active uh, region uh, and, and very dynamic uh, uh, star. Uh, so what might happen at times, so there's a, can you also see my uh, pointer? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So the solar wind is a is a continuous flow of uh, um, of plasma, charged particle, et electrons, and ions. So uh, periodically, what happens on the sun is that there are uh, eruptive phenomena such as solar flares or coronal mass ejection. Uh, solar flares are basically X rays, and CMEs or coronal mass ejections are sort of huge uh, explosive bubble of of plasma. And if these uh, come into the towards the direction of Earth, what happens is that these can perturb our so the Earth has its own uh, uh, magnetic field, which is actually what allows uh, life on, on our planet because it protects us, it shields us from uh, from the outside environment and from the, from the solar radiation. So this uh, coronal mass ejection or high solar spin, uh, high uh, stream of solar wind, high speed stream can uh, oops can basically perturb the, the geomagnetic field. And this has uh, some consequences on our technological assets. Uh, for instance, you can very well imagine that uh, uh, high uh, energetic particles can damage uh, uh, spacecraft electronics. Uh, there are consequences on avionics, on GPS scintillation, and eventually even on the, on the power grid. And all of these effects actually have been uh, studied for, uh, for quite some time. And, uh, and there have been uh, several uh, um, cases where these things uh, happen. Uh, so indeed, the way I, I like to see space weather, it's a, it's a disaster uh, waiting to happen in a sense. And this is uh, sort of, we are, we are sitting here as the bunny in this uh, book of uh, uh, bunny suicide is waiting uh, for, the, for the ice block to, to melt. Uh, now there are different uh, uh, reports and it's, it's very hard to, actually have a, a solid estimate of what will be the economic damage. If you're interested, you can look at all these different reports and, and paper. But the bottom line is that when uh, a big event uh, uh, would happen, this might cause uh, a, a economic damage in the, uh, in the range of uh, a few trillion dollars. And in fact, uh, uh, just recently, uh, you know, this is a disaster waiting to happen, and it, it does happen <laughs> from time to time. Just recently, back in February this year, uh, SpaceX uh, lost uh, uh, about 40 satellites that just launched. So SpaceX, uh, uh, when they launch satellites for the Starlink constellation, they launch about 40 or 50 satellites at the time. They did not realize at that time there was a, actually a, a mild solar storm going on. What that uh, meant is that the atmospheric drag on the satellites was increased and the satellites uh, did not, did not have enough fuel to reach the low Earth orbit they were supposed to reach. So the, uh, the company decided basically to re-entry the satellites into the atmosphere. When they do that, the satellite uh, burns uh, uh, coming down to the Earth. So they lost about 40 satellites. 
so this is the place where I where I work in, in Boulder. It's the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. Uh, so it, it runs under the Department of Commerce uh, and it's the US uh, sort of official uh, 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 center that has the, the, the mandate of monitoring uh, space weather. Uh, there is a forecast office that runs 24 seven. You might look at the, at the website uh, where we uh, have a large number of uh, models or empirical predictions based on, on uh, focusing on, on different products of, of space weather. So the one uh, study I will, I will present here, I will focus on is based on radiation belts. So again, I, I assume that not many of you might be familiar with the physics or the phenom phenomenology behind the radiation belt or even what the radiation belt is. So I just tried to summarize that in, in one slide here. So the radiation belt is, uh, you can see here on, on the left, uh, um, is a sort of torus-shaped region around Earth uh, where uh, 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 energetic uh, electrons and ions are, are trapped. And they are trapped uh, due to the geometry, sort of almost uh, uh, dipolar geometry of the magnetic field. And when uh, um, particles uh, uh, are trapped in a quasi-periodic orbits, uh, you can associate their motion in, uh, with adiabatic invariant. So uh, what happens here is that particles undergo three uh, different periodic orbits, which are listed here. So the first one is, is the gyro motion, which is just uh, uh, gyrating, the particles gyrating around the magnetic field. Then, uh, and this is on the, on the very uh, short time scale, uh, then they uh, undergo what is called a bounce orbit, which means that uh, they go, basically they, they travel from one hemisphere to the other, again, in a, uh, in a periodic or quasi-periodic motion where there's a mirror point here and then they go back and so forth. And then there's a drift orbit, uh, which depends on their, on their charge. So electron drifts one way and the ions or protons drift uh, the other way uh, around, uh, around Earth. Um, so what, what I will focus here is, uh, uh, is this third drift orbit. So there is a whole hierarchical set of, of models to study uh, this, uh, this, this quasi-trapped uh, particle in the radiation belt, when one of these uh, adiabatic invariants is, is broken and the easiest one to break is the third one, the flux invariant, which is associated with drift orbit, uh, um, you, um, you can write, uh, you can study this as a, as a diffusion equation uh, in uh, uh, adiabatic invariant space. So the sort of the first order approximation in, in this community is to study uh, uh, this diffusion equation. So there's a bit of a nomenclature here. So F is our quantity of interest, which is the phase space density. Uh, so you can think it's a unit of flux uh, over momentum. You can think of this as a count or as a number of, of uh, electrons uh, per energy per, uh, per volume. Uh, L or L star, sometimes it's called, uh, is our uh, uh, spatial coordinate, and you can think of that as the equatorial radial distance. The distance, and and this is uh, the the third adiabatic invariant. The unit of L is in uh, Earth's uh, radii. So again, L really is uh, what you call X. Maybe it's it's our uh, uh, spatial uh, coordinate. Um, T, of course, is time. We typically use a unit of days. Uh, and then the, the crucial point here is this diffusion coefficient, which we call the, which we call, uh, the LL. So uh, this equation here really it comes out of uh, a quasi-linear treatment from uh, basically from a Maxwell or a Blasov uh, uh, equation, sort of a model order reduction. You come up with, uh, with uh, this diffusion equation Again, this is in, is in adiabatic invariant space, so you assume that the, the, this is valid for fixed values of the first and second adiabatic invariants, and you actually are breaking the third one. Then there's a, this extra term here, which is meant to capture, uh, I mean, this being an approximation, uh, meant to capture everything which is not uh, diffusive, and it's uh, uh, simply written as f over tau, where tau is an electron lifetime, again, with the unit of time. Uh, so I've, I've quoted here this, this very, very famous quote by uh, George Box, all models are wrong and some are useful, uh, just because this really, at least in, in my community, it's a prime example of a model which is, <laughs> is wrong, just in the sense that it's, it's an uh, approximation which uh, 
relies on a, on a number, very large number of assumptions, uh, yet is very useful and indeed has been uh, uh, studied. Uh, uh, the, what we call the quasi-linear radial, radial diffusion, uh, where the radial means that it's diffusion in, in L. Uh, this has been studied for over 60, 60 plus years, and these are some uh, uh, landmark uh, uh, papers in, in the field. Sorry, can I uh, can I ask a question about that? So sure, sure. thank you. Uh, so for the the connection to Vlasov, is the should we understand that this is a closure or is this an empirical model that is meant to um, give the same sort of prediction that you would get from Vlasov? And either. <laughs> so uh, so starting from Vlasov equation, you can do a. a a quasi-linear treatment of of the Vlasov equation and uh, integrate out some you know Vlasov equation the full Vlasov equation is 6D um, so integrate out some uh, uh, coordinates so it's a it's a model reduction of of the Vlasov equation. Understood. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so why is this uh, useful? Well, just following sort of the. Occam's razor argument of, of uh, parsimony. Uh, I, I like to, to quote again George Box. This is a very nice quotation that uh, probably most of you are, are already familiar with. Uh, Since all models are wrong, the scientists cannot obtain a, a correct one by excessive elaboration. On the contrary, following uh, Occam, he should seek an economical description of natural phenomena. Uh, and then he, he goes on and says, the ability to devise simple but evocative models is the signature of, of the great scientist. And again, uh, this is useful because, uh, and it follows this uh, parsimony argument, because first of all, it's, it's computationally inexpensive. It's just 1D in space plus time. Yet, it's, it's non-trivial in the sense that a very rich family of solutions can be recovered if you assume that tau is, is, um, is lifetime uh, is general enough. Uh, and finally, it's useful because, as, as I said, this is physics-based. It's not something you you start from a sense of an empirical way, but it comes out of a, of a rigorous uh, a derivation from, from physics equation. And indeed, this, this formulation contains most of the physics responsible for the particle dynamics uh, and has been uh, proved successful in many cases, particularly again in these uh, uh, radiation belt studies. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't spend too much time here. Why? Enrico, why is... Enrico can I can I ask also for the last term? The way I I read the last term is like a, you penalizing f to be small because uh, it's a pen. It's a Lagrangian multiplier, right? I can think of tau as one over tau is a Lagrangian multiplier, and I'm trying to make it uh, small. Is, am I, is that or is the absolute uh... value? Well, the thing is uh, that so these particles are, uh, as I was mentioning, are, are quasi transmit. Maybe let me go back to this. So, so the particles bounce uh, back and forth uh, uh, from one hemisphere to the other. In doing that, so while, while they uh, diffuse uh, in, again, in, in uh, uh, well, in, in the other two adiabatic invariants, they change the, their pitch angle. The pitch angle is the angle between their velocity and the magnetic field. So the, the position where the mirror point, so the fact that there is this mirror point is just due to the conservation of the first adiabatic invariant, uh, which, which is uh, related to this pitch angle. So what happens is that when these mirror points get lower and lower, at some point it goes into the atmosphere. And we say that the particle get lost because basically they, uh, collide with uh, neutral atoms, and they are not able to to mirror and to go back. Uh, so this is a, a lost mechanism of of this particle, and that's why we say they're they're only quasi trapped. They're not exactly trapped. So that these terms here is is supposed to capture that that loss uh, that happens on a on a time scale of of tau. So it's sort of a, if you wish. Uh, crude or empirical way of, of, of saying that the, this um, phase space density F as a, as a loss uh, mechanism. And tau is, how, how big is tau? Well, tau uh, depends on, uh, well, it, it is parameter, I will show it in a, in a second. It's parameterized, I, I, it might go from days to, to hour, depending on, uh, on the geomagnetic uh, condition. In other words, whether you are during a storm or or not, whether the whole, yeah. how much the whole field is, is perturbed. 
Okay, okay, thank you. All right. Uh, okay, I don't really need to, to go into the details. Uh, as I was saying, there's there a number of assumptions in the quasi-linear derivation. Uh, uh and and those in a sense i mean i don't like the the raw the word wrong but it, it, they're just assumptions we always use in, in physics so whenever these assumptions are not uh, uh do not hold uh, the the whole theory uh fails down basically uh and then again maybe some other details which are not really needed there are even when some of the assumption in the quasi linear theory works fine there are multiple source of uncertainties in how to uh, define or parameterize the radial diffusion coefficient, which at the end of the day, that's one of the important points during this talk, is radial diffusion coefficient is really, you know, in this framework is where it, it is the is the ingredient that contains all the physics. After you do this or, uh, model order reduction, you end up with a simple diffusion equation. All of the physics, uh, which is basically a, uh, a resonant, a, a resonant wave particle interaction, which is the one that so particles resonate with uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, uh, those are all embedded into this simple number, the, the diffusion coefficient. All right, so what I'm gonna uh, talk really, what is the meat of, of, of this work is the in inverse problem. Um, so this is of, of course the inverse problem statement. Again, we start with this equation and we want to know, so F uh, is our, uh, uh, observable or a quantity of interest. Uh, we have two free parameters, basically DLL and tau. Uh, what is the optimal choice of, of those parameters that makes the result of this diffusion equation most consistent with data? And again, we have data for, for F I will show in a second. Uh, and as we you all know, of course, the inverse problem is much harder uh, than the forward model uh, uh, or the forward problem. It's uh, oftentimes uh, ill-posed and so on. Um, so before jumping into the pins, I just wanted to mention that we, well, maybe this was even before, or maybe at the time that pin were, pins were introduced, we um, try to tackle this problem in, in, in what would be the standard statistical approach with a Bayesian parameter estimation uh, running basically Markov chain uh, uh, Monte Carlo method, uh, which of course is difficult to apply in higher dimension here being in 1D was relatively easy. We could do you know, 50 times, uh, 50,000 runs of, of this forward model in a relatively short time. And um, okay, again, maybe a detail which is not really needed here, but the um, thing is that to do um, uh, this in a, Bayesian, in a Bayesian way with MCMC, you need anyway a parameterization of the diffusion coefficient. So we decided this is a standard parameterization uh, standard in, in the literature. Uh, so here, alpha, beta, and B are our three parameters, and we uh, the NCMC gives you the procedural distribution uh, of those. And similarly, for tau, we, we parameter this in, in a given way. Uh, KP here is a geomagnetic index. You can think of that. Uh, it's a scalar number that gives you a, a, a measure of how disturbed the geomagnetic uh, field uh, is, and of course, is, is a uh, function of time. All right, then of course we want to we'll try a different approach. This is the the, the one uh, reference that you all are familiar with. Uh, so we want to use pin uh, for this inverse problem. I probably need to. Uh, this, this is the one slide I usually use to explain pin to people that are not familiar with. I can clearly skip this. And the way we do uh, use pin for parameter estimation, at least the way I've done it in, in, in this work, and there might be different ways I'd actually like to hear from you on, on this, is the following. So uh, we have our inputs, okay, X, as I said, uh, in, in, in this context is often called uh, L. Um, so it's, it's 1D uh, in space and, and, and time. Uh, so we actually train three, separates uh, um, independent neural networks, uh, also with slightly different architecture. I mean, the first one is, is deeper than the other one. And uh, each architecture, so the first one outputs uh, F, uh, any given space in uh, um, space and time. Uh, the second one, uh, okay, here it's, it's sort of a general um, nomenclature here where I call D and C my, my three parameters. So the second one outputs D, the third C, again, these are independent and they are all lumped together in the, in the loss function, uh, which is uh, 
So uh, seize your tau, and Nico seize your tau, right? See, it will be my well. I, I'm gonna well hold on a second because actually uh, I've I've changed the the problem slightly. So I get rid of tau and I use a, a drift coefficient. So C is a, is a drift coefficient. I'm gonna explain that in a in a second. In fact, it, it, here it is. So what I've realized I actually started trying to apply that to this equation where C would be my my tau. Then I've uh, soon realized that, uh, so what I wanted to achieve is to have both these, these two coefficients, DLL and tau, to be completely general function of space and time. And then I realized that this is just uh, too ill posed to, to be solved as an inverse problem. And you can uh, immediately see that in the sense that no, you, you can give me any, any field of DLL and there will be a, a given tau that allows you to, to solve this equation exactly for for the data you have so it's just too ill posed as, as an inverse problem so what i did is uh, actually to do a, a step back which is actually also well founded theoretically um because uh, you can uh, um so instead of using this this equation on the top you can use a more general uh, fokker planck equation which uh, as we know uh, is basically a drift diffusion equation so I, I kept the first term is exactly the same. So what I did basically is to drop this f over tau term and, and replace it with the, with the advection term, where now I have a, a drift coefficient. That's, that, that explains the, your, your question, I guess. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so this, Sorry, is on the, I... this is on the bottom is, that, is the actual equation I'm going to solve with the pin. What's the architecture for f? So, so this is probability density, right? So is this like a like a hidden network with a softmax on it or um what's no like? the network is actually pretty standard it has uh and now can't remember on top of my head like four or five uh uh layers uh, with relu and uh so it's um uh so f is a scalar so it's it's set up as a as a regression problem so but f is a probability distribution Right? No, it's not a probability. It's 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 a, a phase space density. So it's a number yeah, of sure. uh, number of particles per energy per uh, uh, volume. Yeah. So there, there's no like constraints to impose that it's like a valid density. Well, yeah. In principle, it is is positive, uh, definite. But um, yeah, I guess. The, okay, I, I guess. We'll, understand what you mean so the the only so we worked in in log space uh, just to um uh to enforce that f would be would be positive so uh, whatever basically whatever comes out of the neural network with uh, we exponentiate that and, and interpret that as, as f thank you maybe another point uh, do you have some normalization condition like for focal plant equations or like for the probability density functions yeah everything is uh, is normalized uh, because i mean one problem with the and that's why also another reason why actually we we work in the in the log space is that f uh, ranges several orders of magnitude I, I will show you in a second how that looks okay. like but it goes from you know, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 12 uh so we need we need to normalize that but um yeah, I mean, just do standard normalization. I don't even remember how, how exactly, maybe between zero and one or minus one and one, something like that. Okay, so those are some baseline models we're gonna uh, compare with. Uh, so those are sort of empirical, if you wish, or well, somewhat data-driven, but empirical parametrization of this diffusion coefficient and this uh, uh, tau. Um, Again, the, the crucial point here is that, uh, so, so those, those are three different uh, studies in, in the literature. Uh, they all use as a parameter, as a sort of a proxy of, of time. They don't use time explicitly, but they use this, this index uh, KP, which is um, uh, a three hour index. So it, it basically, it's something that uh, is computed uh, looking at the geomagnetic perturbations uh, measured on the on ground based magnetometers uh, and it's sort of updated every every 3 hours again you can think of that uh, i mean it really is a, a proxy of, of geomagnetic activity 
uh, and then uh, L again is our spatial coordinate. So, so this is the, the parameterization they use. Um, and, and this is even simpler for, for tau. Uh, okay, these are some, some details uh, that are really necessary. So, so we, uh, okay, this is the, the method we use. To, so this is a simple, uh, it's a simple diffusion, brief diffusion equation, but the fact that uh, the coefficients are not constant, you have to, to, uh, to, to use a, a, a method which is uh, stable. Um, Okay, um, then we use this three definition of errors, uh, which are relatively popular, at least in, in, in my community. Uh, one is called the uh, percentage symmetric accuracy, uh, where uh, F uh, hat and F uh, are the, the ground truth and, and the corresponding uh, uh, output model. Uh, so you take the log of F divided by F hat, take the absolute uh, value, uh, PK will be the, well, Usually use P50, which will be the, the median uh, over uh, uh, a range. So basically, we, we compute this for a given um, fixed value of L, and then you exponentiate and, and you multiply by 100. So this is a, a, a matrix for accuracy. This is similar, similar, but gives you a metric for, for bias. And then we have the uh, more common uh, relative error, uh, again, in, in log space, because F uh, uh, varies. Uh, uh, as, a, as a, varies a lot. Okay, finally, this is the, the data. So maybe now you can understand better what the problem is. So this is the data from uh, a, a NASA mission called Van Allen Probes, which uh, has been going on for seven or eight years now, uh, has been concluded a couple of years back. Uh, uh, so these were two twin satellites that were basically orbiting around, around Earth uh, uh, with an orbit of around nine hours. So, so you can see if, if you would zoom in here, you will see a lot of uh, white space, meaning that you know you you, you follow the, the the trajectory of of the satellites, and uh, the the code the heat map here is the log uh, of uh, the phase space density would be f. Um, so we have about um, four years of data, and we use the, the first three years for training and validation of the pin, and the last one year for test. This is sort of uh, arbitrary. And so we have time here on the horizontal axis, and L, as I said, L or L star, sometimes it's called, is the uh, the radial uh, uh, coordinates again in, in uh, Earth uh, radii. And you can see you now this this varies a lot. Basically, every time that there is an injection of particle or, or a storm coming in, you have this this jump uh, that can go uh, uh, deep into the into the belt. And those are these uh, abrupt. Uh, uh, changes in phase space density. All right, so what I've done is the following. Uh, being in you know, our neural network, being a, a stochastic uh, beast, uh, I've uh, trained the pin uh, 20 different times with different initializations. And then I looked at the, at the best five solutions. So what is shown here on the top are the diffusion coefficient, DLL, and the corresponding root coefficient. So those are five different realizations or, or, or solutions of, of the pin. And you can see that, you know, maybe the, uh, you know, they're fairly different in the sense that the fine scale structure might be different uh, from one realization to the other. Uh, maybe the overall trend is, is similar, but again, this is the nature of the, of the inverse problem, which uh, doesn't have a, a unique, uh, unique solution. Um, so these are the results, uh, again, using one of these uh, metric, uh, uh, error metric epsilon on the training set, and maybe not uh, so surprising. So the pin, uh, uh, so these black lines are five of these, are, these are the best five in the ensemble. Uh, so this is an error as a function of L, and you can see the error is always slow, uh, smaller than the, the three baseline models I'm comparing with. Something which is more, maybe more interesting is that if I take, uh, at the end of the day, I just want one uh, solution for my DLL and, and C. So what I've done sort of very naively is just take these this five best uh, and average them uh, now point wise. And I end up with this uh, average uh, sort of ensemble mean. Then if I use this uh, uh, in my forward model, I get uh, um, also a very small error, which is this uh, red line here. Uh, and, and this is not trivial. Um, so, okay, this is really the, the, the bottom line of all this work is that, you know, as I said, DLL 
I mean, in this case with the drift uh, diffusion equation, DLL and C really contain all of the physics of interest, uh, you know, in this framework, where once we assume that this is uh, the, uh, the equation, which is good enough to model the dynamics. Uh, so then from, from a physics perspective, it, it becomes really interesting to, to dig or to data mine uh, this coefficient. And now I have uh, uh, um, at any given time uh, and, and, and space here, right? And, and that's what uh, exactly what we have done. I run some statistical analysis of this coefficient, uh, uh, both coefficients. So this is the log of DLL uh, as a function of L. So, so this gives you the, the median and the, and the spread. And you can see uh, that there are different regimes at different values of, of L. Uh, this one on the right is a sort of more complex way of, of uh, uh, sort of trying to study the, the, um, the statistics. This is a rank distribution, meaning that basically for any given value of L, uh, we look, so we, we bin uh, the, the, the log of the LL, and we look at the, at the value which has the, the most, the higher, the largest number of counts, and we assign that rank uh, one and so on uh, from rank one to rank 20 to see where is the, uh, it's it's a it's a measure of, of density basically where where this ends up the the, the most. Um, similarly, we do the same for C, and here we see even a, a, a different. Uh, uh, well, there's still two or three different regions, but it sort of plateaus for L larger than 3.5 or 4, and he has a larger larger spread. And what is interesting here is that we can actually clearly see that there are sort of uh, bifurcation, two or three different scenario where, where C ends up being, uh, and there is sort of a void here. So as if you know, C either goes into this level here or, or larger. And, and again, this might be related to different physical phenomena. Um, then the next step we have done is, is a feature selection, because at the end of the day, what we want to do is to be able to do some forecast. Of course, the pin is trained for a given uh, 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 region of time and in space, but we want to be able to um, to use the forward model with the learned coefficients to do for uh, forecast uh, in the future. So what we have done is the following: we have used a simple feature selection method, the uh, backward el elimination method based on a generalized linear model. Um, this is not really important, but what is important and what is already probably clear from from this two previous plot is that the most important um, feature or, or, or variable is L. And then we, we have combination of the, again, PSD would be the phase space density or, or F. So this would be a average of F times L. So the, the generalized linear model takes all the combination of, of variables that you input uh, up to a quadratic uh, uh, order, I believe. So for instance, you have DLL square and so on. Um, and then again, once we have, we have learned the, we've done this uh, feature uh, uh, important feature selection uh, uh, exercise, uh, as I said, the, the question is, can we forecast unseen data? Um, so what we've done is, is the following. We have, uh, so we need to have a, a mechanism that generates on the run DLL and C for any given condition and also for unseen uh, condition. So from this uh, feature selection, we have selected these this, uh, five, I believe, four or five inputs, L, the log of, of uh, F, uh, the running average of F uh, over uh, uh, L at a given time, and of course, the, the boundary conditions. Um, the, the important fact here is that we do not use the geometric index KP that, uh, as I've shown previously, is the one which is used in all parameterization in the literature, but it's also the one that doesn't really allow you to do forecast in the future because that will, all, will basically shift the problem into forecasting KP into the future, which you know has been done to some extent, but it's not. Uh, it, it's a different problem basically. Um, so another uh, maybe technical point is that using now PSD, the F as, as an input makes the problem nonlinear because basically now the diffusion and drift coefficients are function of F themselves. So uh, the, the, the equation is not uh, linear anymore. Uh, and therefore, if you want to solve this numerically, you need to use something like a predictor corrector method. 
So just to sum up uh, the sort of parameter estimation pipeline that, that we have done is the following. So of course, you start with an assumption that the physics uh, obey a given equation. Uh, start with the Fokker Planck equation, as I tried to explain, this does not come out, uh, out of the blue, but it's, uh, uh, they're, they're, it's physically motivated. <clears throat> then running the pin, we find out uh, what are the optimal coefficients for DLL and C, of course, in our training set, which is, uh, again, these three years of data in this range of L that goes from 2 to, to 5.5. Um, we run a feature selection based on this to understand how can we generate DLL and C uh, for new uh, conditions, and we select the, the, the top uh, input top uh, the, the, the five uh, most important features. And then we train a machine learning model. And maybe I haven't mentioned this, maybe it was on the previous slide. Um, yeah, so the new machine learning model is an ensemble of decision trees with, with gradient boost. So this is the machine learning model that we use for any given set of inputs to generate the LL and C at any given value of, of L for new for new times, basically. And then we use this new DLL and C into our forward model and solve the equation to, uh, to forecast the new value of F. Hope this, is, this makes sense. And then finally, uh, we have this one year of, of test set. And this is on the left is the error on the test set. Again, this uh, uh, epsilon value is uh, relative uh, uh, error in log space. And the bottom line here is that the, the pin, so this is um, basically average uh, any given value of L, the pin is this black line, which is uh, consistently lower than the baseline. And if you look at the error point-wise in the, in the test set, which again is one year you know, from November 2016 to November 2018 as a function of L, uh, you can see that it's consistently lower uh, in a point-wise sense with respect to the other three uh, baseline models. Uh, these are uh, vertical cats for uh, so it's, it's basically the, the, the same information, but at any at, at fixed value of L, L equal five and L equal four. Uh, and maybe I'll just I'll just point out. So the pin uh, solution is the is the purple one. You can see that particularly for L equal five, which is closer to the boundary condition, which is of course taken from from data. Uh, this outperforms greatly the, the other two baseline models, which are almost never able to, to reach the, the peaks. And then what I like to almost conclude with, I think another 10 minutes or so, is what, what is possibly for many people working in machine learning, the sort of the final frontier, namely interpretable AI. Because even though all these frameworks uh, works to some extent, uh, there is, it's still very opaque and not very interpretable because at the end of the day, we have this step where we train a machine learning model uh, to generate the diffusion coefficients, again, in, in a, in a non-transparent way. So what we have done is to try the simplest possible thing, thing you could think of. So if you remember these um, plots, uh, these were the, the, the red line here are the median values of uh, DLL and C as a function of L. And then we thought, okay, what if we parameterize DLL and C as a simple, cubic polynomial uh, just as a function of L. And, and this is the black line here is the cubic interpolation. You can see already from this figure that it doesn't do a, a particularly bad job. So these on the bottom right are the, are the cubic feet in log space. And now you can use these uh, into your forward model, which makes basically the, the model parameter free, right? Because the LL and C now are, are simple function of L. So, so this model now depends only exclusively on the boundary condition. And by solving uh, these uh, now uh, parameter-free model, uh, those are the two, the two metrics I introduced uh, earlier, the symmetric percentage accuracy and the symmetric sign percentage bias. The bottom line here is that the, the solution of the pin, the right cubic fit is this black line, which uh, doesn't do much worse or, or, or oftentimes does much better than the, base, the other two baseline model, the, the uh, BA and Ozeke. In this case, I didn't. I, I threw away one of the uh, other baseline models because it, it, it just didn't perform well. Um, and again, bottom line is that the, the Fogger-Planck equation in this case has no free parameters. It's completely determined by the boundary conditions. 
Okay, last uh, couple of slides. Of course, we want to uh, understand the, the physics uh, uh, as well. So something that you can do after you run all this machinery is look uh, at, the, at the ratio or the relative importance of diffusion versus drift. Of course, these are two very different <laughs> physical mechanisms. So what we have done is to define uh, the ratio really uh, we call R, which is the ratio of, of uh, advection or, or drift uh, over over diffusion, and see how this uh, changes as a function of L. So this is in, in, in log space. So this uh, black line here on zero will be when the two mechanisms are are completely on the same or are completely equal, basically. And you can see that the, there are again two different regimes where drift and diffusions are comparable up to L equal three point five. Uh, and then diffusion takes over for, for larger L. And this is really a, a, a physics discover uh, sort of allowed by using, using the pin, because again, in this framework, the, for many decades, the, the standard um, uh, equation which has been used is a completely, uh, it, it's a diffusion equation. So, so the idea of adding this drift uh, is kind of, uh, of new, uh, but supported by, by those results. And finally, something which I think comes as a as a as a bonus or as a side product uh, of the pin is this uh, is automatic event identification. So what we've done here, this is now on the training set, uh, is to uh, look you know, point wise in any uh, given point in space and time at the residual of the PDE. So this is what is shown here with this uh, color map uh, some, somehow with saturated colors. And what are shown as uh, these um, uh, red uh, red dots on the bottom is the times at which uh, the residual of the PDE lies in the 99 percentile. So these are the times for which the, the residual is, is the largest, which is an indication that the, the underlying equation uh, is, not, uh, is not satisfied or, or doesn't really uh, agree uh, with, with the observations. And this is a, a way of doing again automatic event identification because what it means is that you know at these times there might be other mechanisms, particularly nonlinear effects, uh, which uh, violates the, the the assumption of the Fokker-Planck equation. Then what what we have done later is to so once we have identified these uh, these are around twenty events, we have done a quick search into the literature, and what we have found is that. For some, for the majority of those events, this is the table here for you know, uh, each event as a start time and end time. For the majority of these, <laughs> there were some papers that actually studied those events uh, uh, and they're associated with storms or, or nonlinear events. Um, for some of them, actually, I haven't, I haven't found anything in the literature. So this may be, again, an automatic way of identifying interesting events that then uh, uh, somebody can you know, sit down and look at the data for and, and try to understand. Okay, these are my, my conclusions. Uh, uh, so I believe that, uh, again, at least in, in my community in, in space physics, uh, possibly the, the best way we can use the PIN is to solve uh, inverse problems, which are typically uh, hard to solve because, again, this is the simplest uh, problem we can think of, but it's already uh, hard in the sense that the, the coefficients are uh, space and time dependent. Uh, so this is a use case where I've derived diffusion and drift coefficients for um, radial transport of electrons in the radiation belt. And we can do a number of things with, with PIN, uh, as I showed, so assess when the quasi-linear assumptions are, are not valid, uh, and in this way aut automatically identify interesting events. Something that I haven't shown, but we, it will be relatively easy to do, is to redefine this electron lifetime. So I, I was showing at the very beginning, I had this term uh, f over tau, then, then I replaced with the uh, with the drift uh, um, term. But then you can sort of redefine a sort of artificial or empirical electron lifetime that uh, will act as a, as a, as a drift. Um, you can improve the accuracy either in now casting or forecasting. And the crucial point here is that we don't have to use the these future values for the geomagnetic index. Uh, uh, KP and finally, what I think it's it's very interesting is that you can reparameterize these coefficients as I showed with a simple and interpretable relationship, for instance, such as a, a simple uh, cubic uh, cubic fit. And um, this is the reference that, as I said, the paper has, has uh, recently been published in um, 
the Journal of Geophysical Research. And uh, this is all I have. Thank you, Dr. Enrico. Do we have questions for him? Enrico, I have a question. Uh, the, what is the state of the art? Uh, it seems to me that uh, you described, uh, and I don't know anything about space weather, uh, uh, but you described a radial, diff a radial diffusion model with correction for the, mm -hmm. uh, the subvection term. Uh, and I was wondering, is that realistic? Is it like a huge averaging over the azimuthal directions and so on? Uh, are there people who are doing high performance computing and they? Yeah, yeah. As I said, this is the, the first sort of first order approximation. The the more complex model will be two D or three D. I think the the state of the art there is to do a, a four D model, meaning that you have the three adiabatic invariants and you do not average along the the drift as well. The what we call the magnetic right. local time. And I've seen. I think the state of the art is even to try to do uh, data simulation on these on these uh, computational models, which is not easy because we don't have, unlike uh, uh, numerical weather prediction that, you know, they have lots of data in, in space and time. We only have few, it's, it's very sparse in, in space and time, we only have few observations. Um, so when, when they do uh, data simulation, I think it's mostly then to do reanalysis in the past uh, more than, uh, uh, forecast in the future but um yeah that, that is the state of the art the, the problem there is that well aside from of course being computationally expensive uh then of course in three or four d you have a, a diffusion tensor instead of just a, a scalar uh then it's it's almost impossible to uh, compute in real time so again you need to have some sort of parameterization uh, or uh, table lookup for those for those coefficients Enrico, it looked like some of, um, for your learned uh, um, drift and diffusion, it looked like the, there were pretty large jumps, you know, not discontinuities, but um, pretty big jumps in the fields that you learn. Is that physical? In, in the coefficients you're talking about or, or in the F? Well, I, I think it looked to me like there was a jump of, several orders of magnitude in the coefficients, which translated to... Yeah. Um, yeah, the reason for this, so something to keep in mind is that this is a, a strongly driven system where, again, you can think of, uh, I mean, in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a closed system, you know, if you think of the magnetosphere, but it's strongly driven by outside perturbation. So anytime that uh, a high speed stream of solar wind pushes into the magnetosphere and you have a leakage basically of, of particle into the magnetosphere. This can cause a sudden change, uh, a sudden change of uh, of conditions. So I, I think it is uh, it is I mean, it is realistic, and it all it, it's all due to this uh, sudden. Uh, basically, I mean, you may, you just change the the outside boundary condition that can uh, that can jump uh, uh, very fast. So is that reflected in the forcing, or is that in the drift, like should we interpret the drift as like encoding that? Um... Well, I think it should be yeah more in the drift than in diffusion in the sense that when when you when you uh, suddenly change your your outside boundary condition, so your density jumps, uh, then you have a, a quick uh, injection of particles into the into the belt, uh, and typically that um, might uh, act faster than than the diffusion, right? Got it. Thank you. Enrico, you mentioned that uh, I forgot. Uh, is it that what, what activation function did you use? Because uh, you could do better, I think, with um, some more sort of like adaptive activation functions like that because of the uh, of the variation of DL. Yeah, well, yeah, we use some we use ReLU, so we didn't really spend too much time into the neural network part. We use something very standard, and I don't can think you use ReLU because it, it's a second order equation. How can you use ReLU? 
You didn't take second derivatives. So it's not differentiable. Uh, to use a, a, a smoother version of ReLU. Like yeah, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the leaky ReLU. I, I, I don't remember on top of my mind. Maybe the leaky, leaky ReLU. But uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Amelia uh, jacked up on a series of papers on adaptive activation functions. I think you will find them useful. So the activation functions are parameterized mm -hmm. so that the, 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 so in the in the parameters are learned by the data. So right. not every neuron will fire the same activation function, basically. So that could be something that... Uh... Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's interesting. Yeah, we can look into that. As, uh, as I <clears throat> said, we tried the... Um... Maybe the easiest thing to implement. I don't. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's fairly easy. Yeah. Okay. Now we can try. Yeah, Amelia. Amelia has. Amelia, do you have the code on uh, the free code on the web, the open yes. source? Yes. Yes, George. Uh, I actually put that on the GitHub link, so I, I can forward forward that to Enrico. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We can try that. Okay. With the GitHub. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. And Rico, do you know other people who have used pins in uh, space weather in general or some, yeah? Well, I know there is, uh, it's not really space weather, it's more plasma physics, I guess. There are people trying to solve uh, some maybe low dimensional MHD equation with, with pins, uh, but more from sort of a proof of concept uh, perspective. I, I, I believe this is the only, um, at least as far as I know, this is the only work that actually, uh, I mean, what I like about this, to be honest, is that we actually use real data from, from the yeah. Allen probes data. And Van Allen probes in our community has really been a, a game changer for uh, for additional belt studies. It's, it's been a very tremendously successful mission. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of papers that use those data. And so that's why, you know, the, the events have been studied very, very carefully. So also this idea of, you know, the automatic event, I mean, the, the, the events have been studied a lot, but in the traditional way where you have somebody, you know, looking, you know, spending a lot of time looking at the data and trying to find things that you don't really understand and then you not know, digging into the physics. So doing that in an automatic fashion, I think it's it's very, very interesting. Um, so, yeah, no, the, the, the short answer is I think this has been the, so far, the first and only work that uses PIN in, in, in that context. But I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm trying to popularize it. Uh, you know, I really... <laughs> Uh, talks I give, I try to explain what pins are and so on. I think not not mentioned to me the uh, text message. Not not Trask is at Sandia National Lab, and uh, he's uh, collaborating with some people, right? Not not you mentioned. Yeah, the, that's right. I mean, we're not as interested in space plasmas. It's more Sandia style plasma physics and pulse mm -hmm. power fusion and all that kind of stuff. Um, so. I'm I'm pretty interested in what your experiences are like in terms of um, maybe wider spread adoption and how open-minded people are to machine learning, is it especially like for the plasma physics community, there's a lot of structure preservation and things that you need to get right. And so people are uh, like, in my opinion, uh, correctly skeptical about these kind of things you know so the specific model you're looking at is it's just drift diffusion it's you, you don't have the electromagnetic component to it and so on right. i'm curious if you have any you know in terms of like long-term strategy for looking at this kind of physics from a deep learning perspective if, if you have any thoughts about that yeah i'm not sure yeah and i agree with you it's, it's a sort of a uphill battle i'm um I mean, my background really, I, I've been working with people in plasma physics uh, earlier in my career, then I, I, sh I shift more towards space plasma and, and, uh, and space weather. Uh, I think that the, the problem as usual with any community is you now when you have, when you have to deal with people that have, have done you know, for the last 20, 30 years, like HPC, I mean, plasma physics really has, has the most complex <laughs> solvers uh, that because as you say, you know, you have to, to solve the Maxwell equations with uh, whether you do MHD or, or even worse when you, uh, so my background really is, is in particle simulation. So doing particle in cell uh, and those are, so 
you know, uh, there is, of course, some skepticism with respect to machine learning. The way I actually see it, and I actually lo love to, to work a little bit on that, is um, you know, the outstanding problem is always the, the, the closure or the, so the, the, the gap, bridge the gap between macro and, and micro scale, so MHD and, and Blaso, so to say. So the way I see, which, which is what the, the fluid dynamics community is, is, is working on, if you can find a, a, closure, a machine learning sort of informed closure that you can use in your fluid equation or MHD equation um, trained on, on kinetic simulations, uh, there will be a breakthrough because, because again, it's, it's a problem that the community has been working on for 20, 30 years and there's still no, uh, no solution for that. That's, that's my personal take thanks yeah it, it'd be great you know if you ever wanted to talk i'd be happy to follow up offline and you know share some details absolutely so you say you you collaborate with people at sandia oh, yeah, i'm at sandia oh you are at sandia okay okay uh -huh. okay Thank you very much, uh, Enrico. Right. A great paper. I'm glad uh, you published in a good journal. You use pins very creatively. That's <laughs> great. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was uh, very, very good to give a talk here. Dada. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. And uh, that brings us to the end of today's talks. Have a great and a happy weekend ahead. Bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.